There we go. All right, we'll get started here. It's uh, a few seconds past seven and a half minutes. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Muldoon, great. I rounded up. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're on to the capital improvement program. Before we get, begin, I want to make sure we address any conflict issues. And the best way to handle this probably is uh, for each council member to announce their conflicts now, and then we will ask a council member who has a conflict to leave the room when the item is discussed by the council. Do any council members have any conflicts that they would like to announce? Um, I have a conflict with the Marine Avenue. Is that, is that what my conflict is there? <laughs> yeah, that would be the Marine Avenue Rehabilitation Project. Marine Avenue Rehabilitation. Rehabilitation. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? And that would be based on real property interests. Ms. Brenner. I have a conflict on the Grant Held Park Restoration Project because of real property interests. All right. Any others? And I have, I, I haven't seen it yet, but it's Lido Median Maintenance Landscape. I don't know where it is when it comes up. What? There's it, another Lido project, but this is the, only the landscape, the median maintenance. It, it, that's right. There was a proposal for a uh, landscape enhancement. Um, to the extent that involves a, a Lido aisle, you'd have a conflict. Yes. Thank you. Okay. And, and just real quick, I think the city clerk has a couple. Um, I have a conflict relative to the Oceanfront Boardwalk parking lot improvement project and discussions regarding the tsunami uh, sirens due to real property interests. And Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I have a real conflict related to the street rehabilitation program on East Bluff. It's within 500 feet of my home. And I have dated conflicts that no longer exist on two items related to telecommunication undergrounding uh, or wireless communications at Grant Howell Park Rehabilitation and the Lido Fire Station. But those uh, conflicts have elapsed, so I can uh, listen to the conversations now. Great. Thank you. So we're on to the capital improvement pro program, and uh, we have our public works team ready to go. Yes, good morning, Mayor, Council. Thank you very much for taking the time to go through this. Um, I'll go through some slides. There, I, I gave you a handout so you can follow and look forward or back if you need to. This is a rather um, uh, large discussion at times. There's a lot of moving pieces, so I'm happy to take any questions. And there's a summary slide at the end we'll be talking to, so if you have questions, we can also hold them till then and, and talk there. So what I want to do is starting off for you and the audience is go back a little bit and set the table because we, we did do a lot of work last year. And as Councilmember O'Neill referenced, we, we did a lot of changes to last year's budget. This slide here basically represents some of that work that we did. Um, and it's the various funding pots that go in to help fund your capital improvement program. Uh, on the top there in those red arrows are, are what we ended up doing last year. We kept the $5 million general fund contribution, which we try to do every year. Um, we reduced the neighborhood enhancement program to zero, the harbor program to zero. We didn't fund the FFP as we normally do. And then the facility maintenance master plan also, we cut that from 1.5 million. Actually, they had two, we had the surplus in there, uh, down to 1 million. So that kind of set our pace where we were going on to funding savings. These next two slides, and I understand conflicts, don't worry about it unless you want to talk it. These are from your last year's discussion. But I wanted to show you these because this represents these two slides, where the money, that $20 million, came from in the various programs. So these are um, for reference right now, but uh, we will talk more about this in a minute. So just kind of see the reminder that some programs were completely canceled, some were partly canceled and, and downscoped, some were uh, partly deferred, and some were fully deferred. And if you look at the end here, the end result there, Basically, we, we deferred about $20 million worth of work, which we talked a little bit about in the earlier session. So, so moving into this year's discussion, what we're thinking about, I'm gonna kind of go to the next slide. We've been working with the city manager's office and finance to kind of get a handle on what we might think funding is available this year. And at this point, we feel that we can at least do the $5 million general fund as we usually do for CIP. We can take the FMMP back to its normal 1.5 million. Uh, we talked to the finance committee, I'll talk about a little bit about the facility finance plan. Um, it usually gets about an $8.5 million transfer and we think we can make that this year. Where we really don't know and, and the discussion goes into, as we talked earlier, is the neighborhood enhancement program, which is typically half of the uh, budget savings surplus. And also in the harbor area, there's still some questions there. So those pieces of the puzzle haven't been fully developed yet, and we're just going down that road. 
but looking forward on that and then going back to the deferred project list. Now this is the same as we saw before, but it's all the projects that were deferred or in works. So I'm gonna take a little time to this, talk to you this, about this particular table. Um, these are the projects um, in various formats that, again, I mentioned were partly deferred or fully deferred. And you're gonna see three tables at the end there, three columns. And that first one is the amount that we had back year when we deferred, and you'll see that $20 million again at the bottom of that one. That next table, or excuse me, column, is what we're looking to recommend if funds are available uh, on a modest level to put into next year's capital improvement program. And then the following column is really about further deferrals. And this is purely subjective at this point. We've talked with the city manager, possible ability to have funding for this, and at a staff level on what projects might be uh, good to go forward. So I'm gonna take a minute to go through that second column there you'll see, and you'll see some X's and some funding things, and kind of tell you where our thoughts are in this and why we're coming to that bottom number of 3.3 million. Again, this is all just uh, at this point uh, proposed and it's really your direction we're looking for and how you want to go forward in this. So, and I won't talk about every project here unless you want to, and I'll notice the two conflicts there, uh, the Marine Avenue. Uh, Commissioner Blom talked about that. I wasn't going to go into that, and actually we're not proposing even moving that project forward until sometime way in the future. So if you want to talk about it, great, but I'm not planning on going there. And also the uh, Oceanfront Boardwalk, there's a conflict. Uh, I believe this is with the city clerk. So... Starting off, uh, you, that first project that I had an X in the column, we deferred 400000 last year in general fund. Uh, I put an X there, and the X denotes we found other money to do that work. Uh, so we're not looking for you to fund this. What, that X in that case is going to be funded out of the $5 million of general fund going into it. And the reason why we're doing that is those alleys are basically on the peninsula with the underground districts finishing up. As I talked to our city engineer and staff, I said, what projects do we know we need to do next year? We know that the undergrounding is about done. I don't think the residents would be wanting to go through another year without the alleys being replaced. So we said, well, let's take part of the $5 million and fund that so it's not a request. Again, that's general fund. We could defer that work. I'm just pointing that out to you, but I want to kind of let you know where the, the background is on that. That next one in the facilities maintenance master plan, uh, I put an X there because we're just looking to get our 1.5 typical. There's a long list of projects that go into that, but we're not asking nor if we ever refund that deferred money we had uh, from last year. Uh, if there's ever a surplus like we found ourselves in two years ago and we want to put additional money there, that would be the council's choice. The next project on there, Ocean Boulevard Concrete, is a project, we, it's, it's a, it's a carry-on project from all the pavement work we did on Ocean Boulevard in Corona Del Mar. However, we work with the council candidate in that area, that's uh, Council Member Brenner, and really look to downsize that project to just do the pedestrian improvements. That's around the Fernleaf ramp where we have no sidewalk people walking in the streets and trying to do just a $250,000 project. And we would defer all the pavement work further out into the future. And then the project below that is a streetlight rehabilitation project. This is up in uh, Harborview Hills in Crone de Mar. We're recommending going forward with this. And again, it shows a deferral of 700,000. And you don't see the complete CEIP yet. You're gonna see that in March in the early look. But that's about a million dollar program there, replace some old series circuit lights. Um, and Grace and I actually had a talk about this the other day, and it's surely discretionary. We had some failures in the East Bliss area, if you recall, last year on some of those circuits, and we have replaced those now. This is the same type of uh, street light vintage. It's, it's high voltage series, hard parts to get, and it's not LED yet. So I recommend that we try to do that project if we have the money, but if we don't, again, we could roll the dice and we could go forward and they're working now. We could try to keep our utilities folks, keep them patched up and rolling. Uh, but it is a project we want to get to. So we're looking for about, uh, in this case, if we could, about 500,000 in money there, which we would match with some other money we have in the current budget to come up to a million dollars. And then that next project on there, the under the projects that were deferred, this is the Ocean Boulevard Median Project. And, and the genesis of this project, this is on the peninsula. It goes all the way back to, I want to say, 2010 when we had the citizens' advisory panels and, and their request to uh, do a lot of work on the peninsula. We've done this project from Coast Highway all the way down to 12th Street. As you know, we've done the median work and, and uh, various improvements there. This has been in the budget a long time. Why am I recommending this? It could be deferred. This is a good to have, although those medians from 12th Street all the way down to Balboa Village are, are starting to show their age. They used to have uh, uh, parking meters on them. We've taken those out. The poles are still there. They're asphalt. They're not, not in great shape. And the other reason why staff would say, well, maybe start working on this, because 
When Jim's group's looking at their pavement management plan, they're noting that Balboa Boulevard is coming up for repaving. And I think that's in the next year or two, but it's, it's coming up. So you'd want to get that median curb work in and, and cuts in the road and everything prior to that paving job. So we thought, well, it's been there a long time. If we're going to do something, it's already planned and designed, we would recommend you go ahead and approve that. And I'll just note that in the prior budget, this was funded both out of neighborhood enhancement and BVAC money. The BVAC, as you know, you uh, fenced some money around that and given them a budget, and they voted to put their money in to make the improvements on this too. So uh, we would propose if it comes back in the budget that we fund it partially from BVAC, maybe half and half, and partially from neighborhood enhancement. Further on down, I uh, have an exit the lecture hall. Um, this is a project that's starting to move forward. It's been a little challenging under COVID and meeting. Diane, uh, Council Member Dixon, sits on that uh, uh, group. And they are making progress. Uh, the X basically uh, denotes that the council's last action on this was to go a 50-50 program, eight million total, four million from the city. Um, and we are proposing to keep that. We've had some talks about that. I understand the lecture hall is getting a little more expensive as the concepts developed, um, but there's been no council action to staff other than it'll be four million complete, all in. That's the, the for the city unless the council changes direction on that. So I didn't add any supplemental funding on that. We're also showing the deferral of the construction because it's going to take some time. I don't think it'll be constructed next year. It'll be in a year or so. So we took the money out of the budget for construction and it'll be re put back in uh, as we get towards it. Yes, sir. I'm Ms. Dixon. Okay, I just want to supplement what you're saying. Uh, maybe just for eyeballs only, just to know that we would not be budgeting $7.2 million for that whenever it were to be happening because as you just stated it's a public private partnership and then also some of the similar comment with the junior lifeguards now does that 3.1 million is that the cap on the city's contribution or is that include the pub so, private. yes, the good question. Those two numbers are uh, what we had our all-inclusive number. Remember, in our budget, we budget the city's portion, and we also budget the contributions. So why it shows 7.2, that's what's left to build it at the time. We had already put in money for design. It would be our $4 million, and the rest would be made up from a contribution, from right. this case, the foundation. Same thing with the junior lifeguards. So the actual cost to the city, just to be clear, is half of... Eight million, so it's four million is what we will actually be planning to spend. And similarly with lifeguards, what is the amount that we want to plug in there in our thought process anyway? Um, Jim, can you help me on that? Two, isn't it two? Yeah, I think that's what the, the foundation now has risen to one million seven hundred fifty thousand. We have not brought that back to you. Council's request to us was once we get the memo of understanding in place on who funds what we would bring that and the concept back for your approval. And that's getting close in the junior lifeguards, probably a little further out in the-, the But library. just so everybody understands, that we, we're still gonna plug in the 50%. I mean, that's the yes. number. It's yes. going to be less than this. It'll be less than that. So in terms of looking at totals, uh, it should be less four or less, maybe less $6 million because we're going to be having other, that frees up money for obviously that the city would be thought to be spending, but we're not spending. Yeah. I get, and I'll, you'll see that more when you have the detailed budget come out, but to your point, it, it doesn't free up money, but it doesn't increase it. Your direction to us was $4 million and, and that's still the programmed amount in the capital improvement program. But we're not looking to add money unless you so choose to direct us on that. Um, our next project on there, uh, Collins Avenue Bridge is part of a discussion we're going to have a little later, but that's the next bridge up for replacement. It's, it's kind of reaching the end of its useful life. Uh, there's some discussion on there. Um, again, we think it's a critical piece of infrastructure that we're going to have to fund either way, so I asked Jim to put that as part of the $5 million uh, portion of it, so we're not asking for additional money there. As you go down further, uh, we have landscape enhancements, and I'll note here if you want to talk about this, Diane may have a conflict on the uh, Leo Island medians, but there are, are several projects around town that are uh, driven by the residents in the community that they've asked their council members to uh, work on, and I've noted three there. Breakers Drive, we've done some partial work 10 years ago, but there's a, a median at the back of the parking lot that, that needs some work. The irrigation's starting to fail. Landscape needs replacement. Um, there's the Lido Park Rehab. That's as you come on the peninsula right there uh, via Lido. There's two small parks there, and they've been there for some time, and the palm trees are now splitting the planters. They're starting, they, they need kind of a refresh, so there's some money in for that. And then we've been working with the Lido Island Homeowners Association 
where they partner with us, they want to redo that meeting as you come right on the island there, and they want to do some uh, enhanced maintenance. So there's some city responsibility, there's some responsibility on there. We haven't put that deal complete together, but that would be funding for that. And, and again, we always have requests and needs throughout the city. We're not asking to put any additional money in there, which you usually have a little pocket just to address those things, but we're keeping it kind of tight this year. So there's 350,000 we're suggesting maybe there. And then the next one there, um, again, this is a conflict for the clerk, but if you wish to talk about it, we're suggesting you put back in the 350,000 uh, when we get to the budget. And this discussion is actually coming back. This has to do with the oceanfront boardwalk. And one of the uh, four items that council asked us to address is look at reinstating the budget that we had to do the study to possibly address the future needs of that. It's probably a four or five year study. This money was teed up uh, to hire a consultant and start the community work to develop whether we do a split trail or, or, or how we go forward on that. Um, I, I think it's a long term thing. So if we start now and I think maybe if we can get through COVID, might be summer, might be fall, start those community meetings, because there's going to be a lot of work with the community. We need to be able to do that. And I'll reference to some of the things we didn't suggest funding. Uh, and again, we'd, we'd like your input either now or at the end of the presentation on all these projects. Um, are things that, uh, for instance, and I know this is, uh, we talked a lot about last year, the, the, the uh, West Newport streetscape, but we also made a commitment to that community to have some robust discussions with them and we haven't been able to do that so we haven't been able to move forward in that so we're suggesting that maybe not we're having the discussions next year but not doing the construction next year that's why we didn't recommend something like that also additionally um you know west newport the very last item on there the the median work we talked about uh, we've done a lot of work on coast highways you know from newport boulevard down and this is another piece of it maybe we can find a way to fund it some other way but we didn't put it in for that reason so I'll pause here if you want to talk about any one of these or if we can also go through the whole presentation and then come back and talk about it at the end as a summary. Thank you. Ms. Brenner. Uh, Dave, I had a question about the Balboa Island enhancements and the benches. What's happening with that? I, as I understand, those can't be deferred indefinitely. Uh, good question, um, and I'll go back to that funding. That funding originally started, and I'll go back all the way to Mr. Rosellich, actually, when he was trying to do some enhancement on the island, we talked about some, the, the island needed some, what I would say, spick and span love. So there was money put in there. As that project that originally was put in there didn't come to fruition, the council over the years, uh, Mr. Herberg, before that would be, uh, we did trash cans, we did some other upkeep on the island, and there was some residual money, this 88000 that was never spent out of that original project. Thus, the discussion we started with the benches, and we're not, we haven't finished that discussion yet, but we just held it there. We took it out, but our thought was maybe something's going to become of the benches. We had a discussion with council on the benches. We know the cost is high to redo those. Uh, the direction from council was not to spend that kind of money on them, but take it back to PBNR and also look for other solutions. We are looking for other solutions. We are actually trying to find a, a, a lower cost way to address some of those benches. It's tough in the public contracting laws and the bonding and the insurance, all the things we do is not advantageous to small work like refurbishing benches, but we're looking at that. That discussion needs to go back to the PBNR. Uh, okay. Micah Martin and I've been talking a lot about that. We've been going through the Balboa Island trees. That's been challenging under COVID, but we need a nice robust discussion on benches and it'll be probably we'll have to wait till we can at least kind of meet on a normal basis to have that discussion. In the meantime, they're, they're being watched and, and trying to be maintained. Okay, and my second question was um, on the Cliff Drive mobility improvements. Can you tell us what that means? and? Specifically, my question is about those medians that I think the city put in there that are so unattractive and what's happening with those. So years ago, let me go to the medians first. Years ago, that was a tra traffic calming effort and they've been there way before me. Uh, when we worked with the Ensign School remodel, we touched some of those medians. We have them being put back in. We, we get pros and cons on those. It's a traffic calming thing. It's a, an inconvenience to some others. It's a, it's a good thing. Um, so we weren't planning on taking those medians out. The, mo the mobility project discussion came out of a discussion we had under that same vein um, about maybe doing uh, bike lanes on Cliff Drive, maybe putting in that sidewalk on the inside. I know we've had some community comments about that. Um, our recommendation is not going forward yet because, as you know, the, the school district is changing the way they operate Ensign. And Ensign's not full right now, and they've changed the gating pattern. They've moved all the drop-offs to Cliff. They used to be on Irvine and even on uh, Seward in the back. 
So traffic patterns are going to change uh, on that, and we really don't know that until the school starts operating again in full force, and then we should go back and look at that. But there was a need, there was a concern to try to make Cliff Drive um, a better pathway, and maybe it'll even become more evident now that all the access is coming off Urban Avenue. So we're not looking to fund that, but that was that project. Okay, so we'll how about if I move on, and, and I'm happy to come back to this if you have any thoughts or as we get towards the end here. Excuse me. Uh, on the funding, on each specific project, would it be help proposed, deferred or not, would it be helpful for us to know what is funded through external sources? Are these all general fund? Do they all hit the general fund, or f only five million of the general fund? Because that's what you draw from. Is um, because that, I think if the money is there on any one of these, I'm not speaking to anyone in particular, but the funding sources now does that mean we have it, or you have to go out and get it? So what? How so we look at this. All all the projects on this list had general fund related funding, either neighborhood enhancement, direct general fund. Um, other means of it, even some Tidelands money, anything that affects the general fund, that's why it was pulled off as part of the 20 million. Uh, to reestablish it, it would have to be of some general fund. Some of these, like I said, you, you provide 5 million every year on the uh, FF, I'm sorry, the gen, uh, our CIP, but we really use that for the nuts and bolts of keeping existing things rolling, pavement, storm drains, street lights, uh, things like that, community centers, some parks and rec stuff. Um, it's, it's not so much used for well, we haven't had the pleasure to use it for nice-to-haves, community things, landscaping, and things like that. So that, that's really been the Neighborhood Enhancement Program. So anything we'd be asking here that's not got a check next to it, I would be looking for some other funding, in this case, what we would call typically Neighborhood Enhancement General Fund. So let's go on to another uh, one of our master plans just so the council uh, can keep up on this. This is our facility finance plan. And we bring this to you every year. Usually it goes to the finance committee and it just went through the finance committee uh, in January. And all the, this is just a snapshot by the way, and we can give you the full plan. I don't know if you want all the details. There's a, uh, various funding mechanisms and things, but this is the project sheet. And all those red uh, squares and lines on there represent some small changes we've made and some add-ons in there. Uh, so there were some project moves where we changed some dates, we added some dates, we corrected some funding. Those were the little boxes. But the two big long boxes are two projects I'm going to talk to you next that we propose to put into the plan now. So the summary with the Finance Committee was the plan, uh, after looking at our development fees coming in and other, and that 8.5 comes in, is uh, well-funded right now. It'll meet its objectives and keeping above its $10 million reserve at all times. Uh, there is a big spike, and again, if you want to get into details, I can have Steve's here today to talk about that. But as we get towards the construction of the police station coming up in 2032, 35, you'll see a big drawdown because that'll be a big hit against the plan, and then we'll start raising again. But this went through. The Finance Committee approved this. Uh, it's funded, and it's, it's, it is a general fund. There is a general fund commitment to it and other things. But we did add two projects, so I'm going to talk about the two projects we recommended um, going forward, and they'll be in this year's CIP, and you'll see it in the early look unless you give us direction otherwise. The first one is a proposed pickleball court up at Newport Ridge Park. And this project's genesis comes out of the need for pickleball. There's the advocates and various folks who'd like to see that. And the HOA of that area, uh, this park actually, you can see the Newport Coast Community Center on the um, uh, downscreen corner there on the, uh, is our facility. The adjacent park to the left is actually a private HOA park. We have usage agreements. Uh, Ms. Detweil and their group uh, works with the HOA on that. But they've, they've offered up to give some property to the city, and you'll see a little kind of sketch there. That's just the thought of where those pickleball courts could go on the picture there. And they'll provide the land, and then the city would take on the construction and maintenance of those courts. So that's a project we're looking to add in. Um, we think if, it, if this council so approves it, we could probably get it designed and constructed next fiscal year. And I would note, too, that, and, and Mr. Atwater could talk to this, uh, they've identified some Prop 68 funds, so we think the city can also bring some grant money to the table. So this project would cost the city $1 million roughly in its FFP program, minus if we could get the grant money, the 231 k noted at the bottom. So we recommended putting this in the FFP and would put it in the CIP uh, should, unless you give us direction. One of the other projects that popped up, we, we have, as you know, the um, 
facility maintenance plan that we do, and that does a lot of, it paints our buildings, re-roofs our buildings, takes care of chillers, but it also, we do, we do evaluations of all the buildings. We just concluded looking through all the buildings again, and it popped up that the 15th Street restroom, a rather old facility, is in need of replacement. Um, it takes, as you can imagine, a lot of abuse. It's one of our front-end restrooms, a very popular area, um, and it's in an abusive environment there right next to the, the um, ocean. So we're looking to recommend a replacement of this facility, at least start planning for it. So we're putting it in the plan, and we're looking at maybe starting the design at maybe 22 and then construct it in 24. Its cost is about three-quarters of a million to do. And again, it's in the plan uh, calculations now, the sheet that I showed you. And uh, finance says that we can fund this, and it's okay and keeps us within our limits of our FFP. So those are those two FFP projects I'd like to add to the uh, budget. I'm going to go on to the... I have a uh, question, Dave. Right. Um, when it comes to public restrooms like that, is there any state money or anything that... I mean, those are definitely visitor service facilities, and is there any state money that is available for us on those? I've never found any. Uh, they would look at that. I guess they would turn around and say, with all the parking revenue and income you get off the beach, you know, uh, you could probably probably find a way to possibly fund them out of Tidelands, because that area is Tidelands. Um, although Tidelands does contribute into the FFP at times, uh, that might be a possibility. But our parks are the same way. We have a lot of public restrooms, more than most cities, along with a lot of our buildings like the fire station on Balboa Island, the new fire station we're building. We, we build public restrooms into it just because we have such a need here, visitors serving. So, but the answer is no so far. Is that, do, do we pull from our parking revenue and, and Tidelands fees for these, or do these come out of... I would guess indirectly because the parking revenue goes in the general fund and the general okay. fund pays for all these facilities. The op all the operation maintenance is all coming out of the general fund. You think it's a you think it's a wash that we do get appropriate revenue for facilities like this that are visitor? I, I wouldn't, I, you know, that's a finance question, but to your comments earlier, we were talking about all the impact we had over the COVID thing, but also I could probably tell you that I heard that our parking revenue was up. Remember all the parking problems we dealt with? And we had probably more business activity than other cities because people were eating here and coming here, but it did have impact. So I don't, you'd have to probably look at a detailed analysis to determine that. Okay, thank you. All right, well, I'm gonna move on to a, a couple other projects. Now these, I've listed three major projects here just to kind of bring it to the city's uh, councils and the community's attention. We always have projects going through, as you know, our list is kind of comprehensive, but there's a lot of other big things coming on. And three of them are listed here, and I just wanted to take a little time to go through these. And the reason why I wanted to do that, some have immediate fiscal impacts and some have near-term fiscal impacts that we need to advise you of. So. I'm going to talk about the lower harbor dredging real quick because that's, uh, as uh, Council Member Duffield just mentioned, we got some federal money. I want to touch on that. And then I'm going to have um, Jim Houlihan talk to the Babel Island drainage, which we've been kind of bringing up. We've been talking to the island about. And then lastly, I'll have Mr. Martin come up and we'll talk about the corporate fueling needs. So, and take any questions on that. So with the lower harbor dredging, this is just a summary slide for folks out in the audience. Uh, as, if you haven't heard, we are undertaking a, an aggressive uh, effort to try to get the lower harbor dredge, the navigational channels, back down to their original depths that they were dredged. They have not been fully dredged since they were originally dredged in the 1920s. We had a partial dredge back in 2012 that picked up some of it, but there's still a great need there. We've been working aggressively with the Army Corps of Engineers, and as you know, over the last several years, I've had the pleasure of dragging various council members, Mr. Duffield and Mr. Avery, through the halls of Congress and keeping them awake at night, and those are <laughs> joyous trips. But um, it's, it's yielded fruit. So um, the project right now, to get it all done, it, we've, um, we've got uh, about a $20 million project we figured out. We basically got the design about done. We're going through the environmental and permitting process of it, and we're getting very close to launching a project. The exciting part, as we just found out, and I put a summary of the funding to date down there, to date, we've got $8 million committed from the federal government. That's largely due to uh, the council members and our avocation efforts in Washington. Uh, we, we got $3 million a few years ago, part of which is going to go to the uh, construction of the levee by Corona Mar. It needs some reconstruction, but majority going to dredging. And we just got another $6.77 million allocated this year, making up $8 million from the federal government. 
But one of the, the, the concessions was, and one of the good things in Newport was, by the way, most people can't bring money to the table, and that's those small cities and ports never get funded. They're just, they never get up on the list. But uh, in order to get on the list, as they say in the menu, um, we put money on the table, and council agreed to do a 50-50 match on this, and that got their attention this year, and then we got funded. But we, we need to come up with that 50, 50 match. So it's $8 million right now to the city. Um, if I broke that down how we've done, this will come out of our Tidelands funding uh, that'll pay for this. We've spent about a million five to date on design fees, doing all that advanced work, the environmental work, which again got us on the menu too, because they saw the commitment by the city. They saw us putting a, a, you know our shoe in the game and, and really working on this and getting the project teed up for shovel readiness. Um, we, we have $4.5 million currently in our CIP, and I'm going to request that we're going to put another $2 million in this year to bring us up to our full match because this project is imminent. It's going through the environmental process. It'll probably come before you for environmental approval in April is where we're looking at. It's going to be probably ending up in the Harbor Commission in March and then Council in April. And from there, with the funding and, then, and we'll get our permits, we should be able to start construction summer, um, maybe fall. Um, and again, that's, there's some more complexities. There's another piece of this project. The core is already going to probably start up in the next month. It's kind of the first phase in the entrance channel. So that's the big summary there. We're still showing, I show about $4 million short on the $20 million, and we're working on closing that funding gap. Uh, we don't have all the pieces yet. It can be anything from maybe a scope reduction to a, to a, a grant, to foundations, to state or county money, some other means coming in there. So as we get closer on that, we'll give you more information on that. Any questions on the harbor? So let me do this. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Houlihan here to talk about the Balboa Island. Jim Houlihan, uh, a deputy city, en or a city engineer and deputy public works director. So Balboa Island, we've had an opportunity, as Dave has mentioned, to speak with the residents on the island a couple meetings a year ago. Um, and we, we look forward to coming to a planning session and giving you a little more in-depth presentation. Um, this right now is a quick look at this, so we'll run through it pretty quick. So the first slide here is um, what we call a heat map, and it's an elevation map showing the island. And specifically, if you notice, the green areas, the light green areas, are in that in an elevation range above sea level, about five and a half to six and a half feet. But the, the darker green or sort of a grayish area, that's at four and a half to five and a half feet. And you can see the west end of the island is significantly lower than uh, the rest of the island. But all, all the island, when, um, when we have uh, high tides above five and a half feet, when we have to close the tide valves, if it rains, we will have water on the island that we have to pump off. So we typically do that. We have 20 to 30 folks out there pumping and getting that water out of that out of the island. And this next slide shows some of the flooding that has occurred uh, back in 2010 and as recent as 2019. And I know we've had more recent um, flooding during high tides as well. But we typically, like I mentioned, 20 to 30 staff members out there in the cold rain pumping that water over the seawall regularly. So. What this project is uh, proposed to do is to solve this problem and reduce that need for, for um, the staff being out there in the, in the weather. What we've got, this map shows um, where our tide valves are. We've got 24 of them on the main, the large island and 11 of them on the small island. Um, right now we're focusing on the larger, the big island portion um, and as I mentioned, at five and a half feet, when the tide's at five and a half feet, that's when we're, we're out there manually shutting all the tide valves. The, um, the purple lines represent some of the storm rain that's out there today. And in the dry weather, when we have irriga or irrigation water and other miscellaneous water, it just drains right out into the bay. If it rains and we have a lower tide, it drains right out to the bay. So what we also would like to do with this new facility is to collect that water and put it back in the sewer and get it out of the bay. So what we're looking at, this is a, one of the concepts, and this is down on Park Avenue, down at Collins Bridge, as Dave mentioned about Collins Bridge replacement. So what, this is a cutaway view underground, so envision that. 
it's not a jacuzzi there. So um, what we look at is collecting uh, a main, we'd have a main backbone storm drain line in Park Avenue. Um, and all the lines, and I'll show you the detail of the lines coming into it. Um, they would come into that toward the middle of the island, toward the west end, and go into this wet well, which would be part of the bridge, and then pumped up and out uh, of, the, uh, of the wet well. So there's, there would be four large pumps that would be sucking the water out and dumping it at a higher elevation than the high tide. So that would be the, the plan. And then, as I mentioned, the low flow um, urban drool, whatever you don't want to call it, would be collected during the dry weather times and pumped into the sewer system and taken off to be treated in uh, Huntington Beach. This is the layout of the storm drain system, a concept to the layout on the west end of the island. All the blue lines would be new storm drain. And those would be in the streets, not in the alleys, as we, um, we're going to be putting in on a portion of this right now is uh, on the very west end, putting the dry utilities underground in the alleys for, uh, for the most part. And I know the rest of the island is looking at a, a plan as well. And then on the east end, um, this area would be collected as shown in the, in the blue and taken gravity to the west end. So this would all be gravity flow. And what we're looking at right now is about a $15 million project. Right now we funded um, in the previous budgets about two and a half million dollars. And we are, uh, we're right now gone through concept. After our study session, we'll look to be going to a final design. And um, in, the, in the years ahead, we'll be looking for additional, we're not looking for this coming year to do any funding but in the coming years beyond that, we'll be looking for um, significant funding for this project. Um, and right now it's looking at a five-year time span. Ms. Dixon. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a quick question. Uh, are there federal funds available? I was seeing the, President Biden's uh, climate action budget proposal about resiliency, a focus on resiliency and proactive investment instead of waiting till the floods happen to protect cities before the calamities occur. Are, are we looking at, we're so always so good to be looking at outside grant sources. I hope we're looking at that. I'm sure you are. Yeah, absolutely. We've been looking at um, grant sources and we, you know, we do compete with Louisiana and Georgia and all those storm city, the ones that get regular hurricanes. So it's very competitive. There is a lot of money, but it's very competitive. And those projects are, you know, they're, they're you know, expensive back east. Not the $15 million. They're like a sure. billion dollar project back east. So anyway, it is competitive. We will continue to work on that. And the, in our presentation, uh, in a study session, we'll go into that as well. Some of the alternatives and opportunities we'll be looking at. I also saw in the article I read about the funding, increased funding for resiliency, including seawalls. Now that's federal FEMA resiliency versus the Coastal Commission that doesn't fund or doesn't approve the seawalls, never funded them, but I mean, as far as approving seawalls going forward. But um, this is a whole new federal effort. And if we're paying taxes, yeah. should try to see if we could get some of that back. Yeah, they'll make, like you said, with yeah, the new, but, new uh, group in that we, um, we may have new opportunities there. All right, thank so. you. Ms. Brenner. We just get so many complaints from citizens when we tear up a street that has been recently repaved. So we're coordinating with the underground efforts on Balboa Island to make sure that that doesn't happen. That's correct. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Okay. So the next presentation, we'll be going into the uh, fueling at the yard. Good morning, Mayor, members of Council, Micah Martin, your Deputy Director of Public Works over Municipal Operations. Um, just want to talk really quickly about our uh, fueling here at the Corporation Yard. As you can see on the map here, we've got two locations where all of our fueling is done. Uh, up in the top corner there with our existing CNG facility and our unleaded fuel. That CNG facility is actually open to the public, and the public enjoys the benefit and use of that CNG facility. And then down in the other part of the yard, we have our uh, diesel fueling island. 
and that's a city for the city's use and we fuel our vehicles in there. Um, just a quick look at our, our, our fueling and the demand that we have for fuel, how much fuel we use. On average, we're about 110,000 gallons a year on unleaded fuel and CNG. Um, that facility, because it's open to the public, it puts out about 193,000 gallons. 10% um, of that is our use. We're always competing with the public for the use of that facility. Um, the two diesel pumps were about 20,000 gallons a year on diesel. And currently we have no electric vehicle charging stations anywhere in our facility. And the table below there is just a breakdown of our city fleet of all of our city vehicles. You can see where the demand is on fueling needs. And um, over the past 10 years, we've been trending upward with CNG with um, state mandates requiring that diesel fuel be uh, phased out and we start utilizing more CNG equipment. And then there's new, more recent legislation with regards to electric vehicles that we'll talk about in another slide. Um, Micah, um, could you just explain what CNG is and who uses it? Yeah, so compressed natural gas, um, it's, it's natural gas that's used to fuel vehicles as opposed to, um, you know, a, a traditional unleaded fuel or diesel fuel. And it's a cleaner burning fuel. And there's a state mandate through AQMD to start um, using that more and more for, for cleaner bu burning fuels. Um, the public doesn't typically enjoy CNG as much because most of the um, most of the fleet utilizing that is you know larger vehicles. A lot of our medium duty equipment uses that, but like school buses, trash trucks, um, the sweepers. Uh, Costa Mesa brings their sweepers by, gets fuel from there. Um, the school district brings their buses by. A lot of our commercial haulers come in and get fuel from that facility. So a lot of the medium duty um, fleet of the public is is using that facility. And is that the only station in Newport? It's the only station in Newport Beach, correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a quick question, Brad, on that. Um, after our discussion at council the other night on the hydrogen fueling station, I was talking to a citizen who had done an extensive report on hydrogen and felt like hydrogen is really kind of the wave of the future, especially for fleets, what, what's your opinion about that? And is that something we look at? Uh, that, that's still new technology and we're learning a lot about that. Um, it's mostly used for, you know, light duty type, you know, passenger vehicles and that type of stuff. So it's still new technology and it's something we'll continue to monitor and keep an eye on. I'm not aware of any, um, you know, municipalities using hydrogen fuel yet, but it's definitely new technology that's being advanced trying to replace fossil fuel technology. So it, it's something that's definitely on the forefront and continue to produce moving forward. Okay. Next slide here, just, you know, so some of the challenges to talk about in a little more detail with our current fueling system and, and while we're talking to you guys about this today, um, the existing site circulation and security is challenging for us. Um, the public use of the CNG system, it requires 24-7 access. We allow anyone to get fuel at any time of day. Um, the diesel pumps are located at a different area of the yard, so the congestion and traffic going back and forth through the yard to access that fuel is challenging. We have other, you know, departments in the city that come in to use those pumps, and there's just a lot of traffic coming in and out. So um, keeping the yard secure has is, is always been a challenge for us. Um, the CNG station is open to public use, and it creates a high demand. Um, and that causes long repressurization times at the pump. So, you know, there's a storage tank and it stores only so much CNG gas. And after a few fuelings, it, it, it draws it down. So the compressor has to kick on and build that pressure back up again. And that just adds a lot of time at the pump. We spend a lot of time at the pump because we're competing with the public in that, in that access. So it's, it's, there's a loss of efficiency there we need to focus on. May I ask a question about that? Yeah. Doesn't that public access uh, agreement requirement, doesn't that term out at some point? Yeah, so um, the, the grant requirement of making that available to the public, we, we've passed that window now. And then our agreement with um, Clean Energy, who operates the system, it expires in 2023. So we're at a point now where we can make a decision. Do we want to continue to allow the public to have access to this facility? Do we want to take it over and make it our own and exclusive to us? Um, Either way, some work needs to be done to it to increase its capacity, to make it more efficient, and, and possibly look at the revenue. It does generate about nine to $10,000 a year in, in royalties that we get from that. Um, but 
the, the agreement that we have with clean energy, that was an offset to our cost. So if, if we no longer have that agreement and the public access, then our cost, operating costs would increase, and as well as our capital costs. That's correct. We would be responsible for the cost of the maintenance moving forward. Mike, can I just, just to expand on that. Uh, you notice it's 10% usage, but I believe that doesn't account for a lot of our consulting services we've pushed out, our trash trucks and sweepers also use CNG. So this actually our city functions. When we talk about congestion at the pump, there's a lot of downtime, as Mike is mentioning, when we try to take a vehicle there or our sweepers or trash trucks go, because either the pressurization's not there or the public access has taken a lot of that use. One last thing to note on CNG and public access, the closest station for us in alternative if ours goes down is Irvine. So if we need to fill our trucks or the public needs to do it, if we try to remove this and not have the public do it, they have to go to Irvine or all these other agencies. So we're kind of in a catch-22. We've already committed and built a facility there. So removing public access isn't as easy as, even though we have the legal right to do it now, I think we'd be doing the community probably a disservice or some of our neighbors. So sorry to interrupt. But then also, then if we continue that, and if, if someone outside supplier wants to continue to operate the facility? Is that what they do, or supply the fuel, obviously? Uh, they could, and the folks we are working with now have other public agency uh, locations. They could create another uh, CNG location somewhere in South Orange County, or I should say around us, that's purely a public location. I, I just don't think they've done that, but that might be a solution, too. Our, our concern is we're getting more and more CNG vehicles, more and more usage. It's causing a lot of uh, downtime on our equipment because of the lack of ability to fuel the Is it more capacity that's needed? Capacity could be one of the solutions. We've talked about slow fills, like uh, we saw out at Paris in the refuge. They, they do that. We talked about adding that. That's part of the discussion that Mike is looking at. There's a, there's, there's a complex equation we have to figure out here um, before we figure out the best solution. Okay. Mr. Blom. Sorry, real quick. Do we have a price locked in um, that we have to charge the public, or can we adjust that pricing to make this more... Um, there, there's, um, there's, it, it's, it works just like unleaded natural gas price per gallon. It's, it's whatever the market rate is, and, and clean energy controls that because they're the ones operating the station. Got it. So our return on this is from clean energy, the right. eight nine thousand dollars. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Okay. And then um, just to speak further on the underground unleaded tank issue, so we have an underground tank at that same location as the CNG facility. Um, those, those tanks expire in 2024, so they'll need to be replaced. So in order to do the work to replace those tanks, it would take down our unleaded fuel and our CNG fueling because it's part of the same island. So there's a bit of a challenge there we have to pre prepare for. And like Dave mentioned, access to CNG fueling at other locations is, is a challenge for us going to Irvine or Fountain Valley, something like that, you know. So um, we need to start planning for how we're going to work through that. And then um, just something to mention, Future electric vehicle regulations are unknown, but we do know that Gavin Newsom passed um, legislation as recent as September setting goals for us uh, zero emission vehicles. And um, we're looking at as early as 10 years from now, possibly having to start utilizing much more electric vehicle technology than we do now. So as that legislation continues to get developed and put into action, we'll know um, what's expected of us and how we'll start adjusting our needs with our fleet and having electric vehicles as part of our everyday operation. It's not just California now. You read yesterday that General Motors has the same goal of, of eliminating uh, gasoline engines, so going to zero emissions by 2035. And it's just going to be a matter of days before we hear the other automobile manufacturers saying the same thing. So. This is a good opportunity for long-term planning. <laughs> Absolutely right, yeah. Probably, so, al probably also worth noting, it wasn't legislation, it was an executive order, and oh, right. so, big yes. difference. Yes, all yeah, right. right, thank you. Okay, and then um, this is just some preliminary fuel island options we're looking at, looking at some of the different areas we could focus on and where we wanna put our fueling. You know, if we wanna expand the island out there where it's at now, to something larger with more capacity? Do we want to keep it open to the public? Um, the green box down there is a, maybe a location we could utilize for electric vehicle charging. Um, the Diesel Island, um, even some slow fill, even further over there to the other side by the transfer station, maybe some slow fill CNG there. So just some options we're thinking about, different things we could look at moving forward, and um, that puts us into the project category with Jim, so I'll, I'll turn that over to him.
And so on the, the, the project itself, um, we have funded, or you have funded in the budgets in the past, um, $350,000 for preliminary layouts and, and studies. And, um, and that's, we're just getting into that now. We're gonna go into uh, that and we'll have much more, a lot more discussions and study session on this as we get closer and, and with a concept. And, um, and this coming year, we're looking for another 100,000 for um, the, the final design along with some of that 350 um, to move forward. And out uh, two years is the bigger chunk of money for the actual improvements that we'd be looking for. So that's where we are right now. So just some look into the future. We have some work to do. Um, we'll probably start getting together maybe with our building working group or something and try to put some pieces together in this to get some better budget estimates, uh, start some preliminary design. It's an important topic. We're looking ahead because we surely want to get caught with it. Like, for instance, we lose our unleaded tanks and we're now out of compliance and we can't fill in. We have to go to public gas stations or something like that. So we're trying to bring these things forth. This would probably end up it, where council wants to put, I'm guessing, the facility finance plan or something. It's not in there now. We'd have to put another thing in there and check the budget to make sure it works. So let me go on to um, kind of an overall slide here. And we've talked about several things so far. Um, this slide is what I call our unfunded capital and kind of looking for council's direction. And I'll go down this uh, list with you here. Uh, that first item there we've talked a little bit about that 3.1 million is basically the deferred list from last year and our recommended projects in there. Uh, again, any one of those projects can be brought forward or none of them. It's council's discretion. It really has to do with uh, working with the city manager and how much available revenue you have and where you want to put it. But there's 3.3 million there in uh, deferred projects we're thinking we should go forward. That next item there is, as you know, we're working on our general plan. Well, we currently have money on our budget now, but the uh, Community Development Department is indicating they're going to need another $650,000 programmed in next year's CIP to keep that effort going. Um, the city manager talked a little bit about that third item, the uh, permanent support of housing. So she had a number up there of $3 million. We're thinking we can probably get a million dollars of that through development agreements or something. So we look like we have a hole of $2 million we'll need to fill. I understand that's one-time money, but we could put it in this year's uh, uh, capital improvement program to uh, fund that. Uh, the next item on, you've had a little discussion on upgrading our tsunami uh, warning siren system, the community system. Uh, the police department's looked at that, and they have some information should you want to talk about this one, uh, about a half million dollars more to replace the existing three towers and add four new uh, siren locations. Uh, next unfunded need request this year was from the fire department on their alerting system. Uh, they are changing between their current system to a new system. When we built the Corona Del Mar station, we put the new system in there. The new Lido station, or the whatever we're going to name that, fire station two, will be um, a new system, but there are still uh, six stations plus the lifeguard uh, uh, facility that needs to be changed out. So about another 475,000 there. We had a, a request from the community on uh, the 38th Street Park. Um, we probably need to replace the perimeter fence on that park. This is the, the basketball court down there in 38 in Balboa. Uh, there is a community request to add locking gates to that uh, to limit play, I believe. I don't know all the history on that, but that would be included in the project should you want this project to go forward. 50000 there. And then the last one we noted on there is there's a need to upgrade all the cameras, the security cameras in the City Hall, uh, Civic Center, library area, along with one down in Corona de Mar, uh, little Corona de Mar Beach. And then there's a software upgrade to that. Putting, they're on multiple different platforms now. They want to put them on one platform so they can all talk to each other. So our IT group is looking for $275,000 to do that work. And then I just put a note here because this is a great time. You all talk to the community. We've tried to capture everything we've heard so far. Um, we typically catch some stuff here, and then when we come into the early look in the first meeting of March, we'll be showing what we've kind of put together, another opportunity for council and the community to see what they need into the, the document. So at this point, I'd turn it over to you for any direction you want to give or questions you have on possible capital projects. Thank you. Mr. O'Neill. Yeah, just a quick overall Comments. So, I mean, just two projects alone, the Belleville Island and the CNG, we saw that the anticipated ask into the 22-23 budget is going to be almost $10 million. And so what that tells us is that when we're planning for the 21-22 budget overall, anything that we defer out of the 21-22 budget 
into the 22-23 budget, it's also now going to include a $10 million ask on those two projects alone. So, uh, I mean, it goes back to my comment from the previous session, which is that as we're looking through and trying to decide how to balance the uh, this coming budget cycle, um, any deferrals we find on a one-time basis on the CIP continues to be very expensive to keep deferring into the next budget cycle, given the opportunity costs lost and uh, anticipated. So it's, I know it's hard, but I just want to point that out as we're making tough choices that it's, um, it's not just this next cycle we got to plan for. It's two years, three years out. So uh, anyway, it's gonna be tough. Mrs. Brenner. I agree. This is where the work of council gets really hard because everything is so important. But um, I just wanted to mention on the security cameras, it's like there's sort of a trade off between extra personnel versus having our security cameras work well. So it really, you know, maybe there's a balance there that we're saving money in one way in order to pay for it in another. And my other. Um, question or maybe comment was about the fueling station and how that relates to our our new contract that we're anticipating with CR and R and the new trucks that they're going to be purchasing in order to service our city and and do you know like what's the best source of fuel for Situations like it's like you don't want to buy trucks that fit to this fueling situation when there's a new fueling mode out there that would be better. So how do you figure that out? So good questions. Um, to the camera question, yes, there there's trade offs and all that. Um, we do use some of those, and I know the law enforcement. If we have, a, I don't know if they're monitored so much on the forward side, but they're surely good. If we have an incident, they can go back through the tapes and say what that is, uh, or if they're getting a call, let's say prone to mar, maybe so they can go to the camera, they can say there's a bonfire down there and it might save us sending someone down there or not. Uh, again, there, there's a pros and cons of that because there's cost. That Corona Mar camera is very, it's in a very aggressive zone. It needs a special camera, I know, because Coastal won't let us have a regular camera. I hear that one's like 25,000. I mean, it's an expensive camera because it's infrared and various things. So, but it saves money. There's, there's, we don't have to send a person all the way out there every time. So, uh, to the, the other question um, on fueling, I think we're going to be C and G on all the new trucks for the near term. Uh, that's the current requirement. And an, an average refuge truck, we're thinking seven to 10 years. So I think our next contract will be C and G. But as you know, we're going towards elect electrification. I don't know if we're at the point of technology where we can get an electric truck that will drive all day with that much weight. I mean, that's going to be one of these things. I, I'm turning over to Duffy here, but he says it'll happen. But I'm trying to run a five truck ton up Newport Coast Drive. <laughs> You might be, how do you, and they recharge, it's a long recharge time. So we're, we're going to have to figure that out. And again, that's why that's a complex equation. Um, we're going away from unleaded. We've been going to CNG cars. Maybe we're going from CNG now to electric cars. Maybe we need less unleaded. I was talking to Mike about that instead of 20,000 gallons. Maybe we just build one tank and we go to 2,000 gallons and we do the, the valleys. And if we have a peak, we use consumer cars and we hit the private system. We go out to Arco or something. There might be a solution there. Just one note, too, on the funding. I know that's an expensive fix, and there's a, there's a big discussion still in that. That's why I wanted to talk about it today. But um, because it's natural gas, we can probably use our AQMD subversion funds they give us uh, to pay for that, so it won't be a 100% general fund hit. We haven't worked that out yet, but that would be part of that discussion, looking for other means, to Ms. Dixon's point, looking for grants and other ways to fund these things uh, to make the changes. There, there's got to be some initiative probably coming in hopefully out of Mr. Newsom and Bison who have these wonderful ideas to put electrification out there. I hope that money comes behind that to build the charging stations and the infrastructure because it, it you know we have nothing out the yard now and to my mind goes well it's not just getting a hose to plug into a car we don't have the transfer and the capacity loads the electrical generation at the yard to run that whole fleet that's going to be a whole nother cost so big big equation to figure out. Great do we have any other council comments or questions? All right, uh, we'll go out to the public. Anyone in the community room wish to uh, speak on this uh, meaty topic? Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor Avery, members of the council. 
I assume this is comments on the entire item that we just heard. And I have two comments on that. Uh, first one regarding the first new project that you heard about in the handout, which was $1 million for pickleball courts adjacent to the Newport Coast Community Center that are on land in a private park that is generously being made available to the city by the homeowners association that owns that park. I wanted this council to know that when Newport Ridge was developed by the Irvine Company, the understanding was that the Irvine Company would develop those parks and as is common with developments, dedicate those to the city for the general public use. And the Irvine Company did develop the parks, but a former council rejected the offer to dedicate them to the city, and that is why it is a private park. I found that one of the odder decisions of the former council. Uh, and the second comment I wanted to make is this council last year appointed ad hoc committees to deal with the funding of two of the projects that you heard about, one of them the library lecture hall and the other one the junior lifeguard building. Uh, those ad hoc committees were advisory to this whole city council. Uh, their term ended on December 31st last year. I at least, and I don't think the remainder of the council ever heard any report back from those two ad hoc committees. So I'm wondering if they reached any conclusion about how the funding for those two projects would work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment from the community room? Oh yeah, here again, I have a um, small comment on fuel. So hydrogen is um, starts to take off now. This technology, I have been hearing about it at UCI for years. So I think this research, this um, technology has been, seems like it's taking off now. Uh, I know in Northern California, um, this organic waste is being converted to hydrogen for fuel cell uh, trucks. And that's been a uh, work, there's a research project. I'm not sure if it's actually uh, happening, but at least on the research stage um, in Long Beach at the port. I think LA port too. So anyway, this is um, taking off now. Um, clean natural gas. Um, Last time during the study session um, on the organic waste, or maybe I should just say the recycling uh, study session, this question came up and Dean from CRNR said that um, they produce from the uh, Paris anaerobic digester facility, they produce renewable natural gas. That is indeed renewable. And you can put that into the CNG uh, trucks he also said that their RNG is cleaner than electricity. That's because we're not using 100% clean energy yet. So, but there is another piece of the puzzle about the uh, RNG. Unfortunately, I'm not saying anything bad about it though. Um, so, you see, Davis has a report that this RNG would be better off to be used 100% on site instead of transferring it through the pipeline because it leaks through the pipeline. So using the on site 100% would reduce carbon emissions, would reduce carbon emissions by up to 67%. Now the tricky part is that for SB 1383 organic waste reduction, cities are required to buy organic, recycled organic waste products. So that's typically mulch, compost, and now renewable natural gas. So um, should we buy it? Um, Costa Mesa seems like um, they don't want to buy it because of this environmental impact. This is just FYI. I'm not making any suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment from the room? Okay. Uh, any phone comments? 
We've got one call. Go ahead. Hello, please mute your device and go ahead. Please go ahead. All right. I'll bring it back to the dais. Do we have any other questions or comments from council? Seeing none, um, we're headed toward adjournment. Mr. Muldoon has something to say. Yes, thank you. Um, you may have noticed I've been a little absent-minded this morning. Um, I'd like to adjourn uh, in memory of my Aunt Katie, uh, who recently de is deceased as a shock to my family. Uh, she left my cousin Sam and her siblings, Edward, Kevin Frank, and Mary, my mother, and uh, we love her. She was a brilliant woman with uh, many accomplishments, but the greatest of which bring, is bringing Sam into the world. Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned.